So, I do not seek to promote an oversimplified bad apple approach to problems and questions of trans violence. Instead, for this talk, I would like to refer to a range of largely structural phenomena that play a part in the sort of structural genocide that is happening right now around us all. I talk of being trans as post-capitalistic and against the law. This is not meant to be taken as exactly a liter literality, but as an angle into a deeper idea. Everyone is in some way immersed in the web of global capitalism, colonialism, and globalization. I do not mean that trans people are not accomplices in this cycle of exploitation, but rather that we are largely forced into a position where in order to subsist with an eye, to subsist and live with an eye, ear, and heart towards our own authenticity, we must circumvent the mandates of these policies of control. I refuse to say that these three ideas, capitalism, colonialism, and globalization, are the sole crux of any dialogue against, of violence against trans women. I'm simply shining a light on this thread that I feel goes largely untouched. So now I would like to get into just a little bit of some fragments of solutions that I see in regards to this one aspect, capitalism, colonialism, and um, globalization. So obviously I'm not even talking about sexism hugely here. I'm not talking about cis sexism. I'm not talking about a number of other things that I could be but we just don't have time. So, the first thing uh, is post-capitalism. And I don't want to overly go off into theoretical definitions land because that's messy. Post-capitalism, let's just say, thinking outside and beyond and acting outside and beyond of a capitalist structure. So, there's a lot of examples of this today and specifically within trans communities, I want to focus on certain acts that I consider post-capitalistic, um, specifically doing community building in marginalized communities, I believe is post-capitalist because capitalism seeks, again, the divisions that enable us to be repressed and exploited because a unified minority is no longer a minority so community building in marginalized neighborhoods, I consider post-capitalism. Um, and I can go into that deeper, or you can, whatever, another time. Decolonization, an essential piece of this puzzle, and an essential piece that I would like to um, ask Melanie here to talk more about in her talk, but one place that I've found to be able to look to as, a, as an ally in, um, is places like two-spirit organi organizing tactics, organizing tactics within two-spirit communities, Native American communities, people who identify as two-spirit may or may not identify with the larger LGBTQ-like agenda, and often decolonization as a central point of queer social movements. Also in, and this is largely from critical queer indigenous theory, um, the kind that's actually written by critical queer indigenous people. <laughs> not, not the other kind. And um, another example, maybe some folks have heard of Julieta Paredes, she was here a little while ago, um, from the Mujeres Criando Comunidad, uh, sort of an autonomous organization in Peru, I want to say, um, and who specifically mentions trans women and intersex people in um, their model of feminism and their model of anarchism in its practical application, which is totally amazing and uncommon. Um, and also that we challenge really privileged queer or largely lesbian and gay agendas that don't include decolonization. Uh, because if we're not willing to give up our privileges that are illegitimately stolen, how can we expect to get others for ourselves. Um, finally, globalization resistance. So we can look at, we can look to Sabatismo in Chiapas or across the rest of the world as it's spreading. Uh, we can look to even things like urban gardening in the sense that I actually spoke with Ian Solomon, uh, with a class, Ian Solomon, who's the head of the World Bank for the United States. That's one of the most powerful people in, in the world at this moment. 
um, was able, fortunate enough to be able to have a Skype conversation with him uh, yesterday, and he specifically said that sub. Well, in my take from it, how I understand it, <laughs> thanks, Jenna, <laughs> is that subsistence is not a goal of the of the World Bank, and subsistence is living within your own means. Subsistence is having a community farm. Subsistence is not opening up your localized economy to um, neoliberal exploitation. So um, things like that, subsistence communities, transition towns, what have you. Um, you can look into that more on your own. Prison, and finally, very importantly, prison abolition. So we can look to, in Oakland, there's a chapter of, I believe, an international organization called Critical Resistance, which has been doing this work for a long time. And if you want to get more involved with prison abolition work, or even letter writing, which is a very post-capitalist prison ab abolishing tactic in my mind to remind someone who's incarcerated that they're a human being by being like, hey, how are you doing? You know what I mean? Um, uh, also, organizations like Transgender, Gender Variant, Intersex Justice Project, who I feel fortunate enough to have uh, a, a friend of mine come to speak from, and also some other people from the audience are here as well. And finally, just community development as a form of prison abolition. Um, and what I mean by that is I, I talked to this young man who was incarcerated since he was 13, basically, in a number of different situations. Um, and I asked him if he would have committed the first crime that he committed when he was 13. This is actually one of Chris Lee's events. I asked him if he, w if he feels like he would have committed the first crime that he committed uh, when he was 13, uh, which later, by the way, he was ultimately charged as an adult for as he got older um, and closer and wrapped up in some other things. Uh, if he would have done it, if his community had been supporting him, and he said, no way. That's what he said. He said, no way. Not a chance. You don't, you know, you don't engage in things that, that send you to prison or otherwise, ultimately, when you're 13 years old. Um, if there's not some huge cultural forces, structural forces at play. So, four main points, again, just to sum up. The situation for trans women, especially those who are additionally marginalized, is currently terrible. Two, the situation for trans women intersects and is relevant to the experiences and oppressions of cis or non-trans people as well. Three, our liberation through and beyond repressive systems such as capitalism, colonialism, and globalization is interdependent and we urgently need each other. And four, very important, there are varieties of movements and organizations already happening that need support and connection. And so I'm just going to read one more poem, um, just a poem, a quick, quick poem as an introduction. And this is from a book I found on the ground, actually. I can't believe somebody would throw this out. Poems from Guantanamo, the detainees speak. <laughs> I was so happy. Um, so this poem, this poem, and I'm, I'm done, Gina, I promise. Uh, it's by, I, and I'm going to do my best with this, Shaikh Abdurrahim Muslim Dost who's a Pakistani poet um, who spent nearly three years in Guantanamo, innocently. Um, and he wrote this poem. Just as the heart beats in the darkness of the body, so I, despite this cage, continue to beat with life. Those who have no courage or honor consider themselves free, but they are slaves. I'm flying on the wings of thought, and so even in this cage, I know a greater freedom. So thank you so much for letting me speak.
want to say in front of everyone that me, I'm very proud of you. So up next, we have Miss Melanie Mahina Malama Lama. Did I do it right? Hey, girl, hey. Um, <laughs> Melaneke, who is a Native Hawaiian Mohu Wahine, whose leadership and commitment to the groundbreaking HIV AIDS Stops With Me social networking campaign, and dedication to developing advancing diversity within the transgender community. She was the recipient of the third annual National Asian and Pacific Islander HIV AIDS Awareness Day mm -hmm. and the Nakatani Ohana Award in 2007. Let's welcome Melanie. This video was done as <clears throat> uh, part of a pilot program for um, HIV um, infected and affected people, um, Asian and Pacific Islanders, um, and uh, the pilot program is more <clears throat> geared towards allowing people in the same situation uh, to find a place and a voice for themselves, to be able to um, speak their truths and be more open and more free to express themselves and to feel um, less isolated. Um, and um, this has gone, um, this program has gone uh, national and international already. And so they're, they're actually implementing um, uh, this kind of um, digital storytelling. It's a digital story. Can you talk a little bit about your work with TGIJP? Sure. So TGI Justice Project, um, <clears throat> I was approached when I was working for Filipino Task Force on AIDS um, in 2004 by Alexander Lee, who was um, working on his Juris Doctorate. And he was um, beginning to, to form the foundation for um, Transgender Gender Variant Intersex Justice Project. <clears throat> and so he went around to get community support, and that's how I um, initially got started, um, volunteering my time, doing, um, at the time we were doing mostly pen pal work, um, working with um, alternative sentencing, um, uh, helping the transgender um, uh, women of color community um, work on their cases for immigration, um, <clears throat> um, incarceration because of uh, commercial sex work, um, that trade um, also because of um, in most of the women of color community, the transgender community, many women grow up and into um, the sex trade. Um, and because of that, they are more vulnerable to um, abusing drugs. <clears throat> and um, that's because they want to mask, you know, the things that they have to do in order to survive. Um, in doing sex work, uh, first of all, it's it's not something that anyone would really, from my perspective, choose to do. There are many of them who are wonderful um, commercial sex workers. They have homes across the country. They have um, they uh, support their families. Um, the, the, these uh, women who are um, facing. Uh, deportation because their immigration status is unclear. Um, many of them are in hiding, so they're also afraid and af um, in fear of um, the PIC, the prison industrial complex, which includes the police, um, the court system, um, the jails, the prisons, um, sheriffs, um, anybody in a position of authority to um, to force someone into um, a box. I think I went off a little bit, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> um, to, to kind of tell you more about colonization and um, the effects of colonization on, um, I'll talk about the Mahawihina community. Can you speak a little bit more directly? Sure. The mic? Oh, okay. Thanks. Ooh, I'm gonna need the mic. Can okay. you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Being Native Hawaiian and being a Mahuahine, um, basically that's a, a, ter 